So I'll talk about another high energy physics experiment that uh, um, has been uh, uh, done at uh, um, China and uh, in China and uh, by uh, people here at the uh, at the Berkeley Lab uh, as well as other institution. Um, Ian is from the physics department, and so was uh, um, very heavily physics oriented in his talk. I'm in the computing research division, so I'll talk a little bit more about the computing, but I'll try and start out with a little bit of physics. So, um, the Dibay experiment is the first sort of major uh, um, physics experiment between the, um, in, that is a, a more or less equal partnership between the United States and China. It's uh, very typical of high energy physics experiments, although at a much, much smaller level than the, the ATLAS or LHC experiments. Um, it's global in nature. It requires uh, marshalling many people from many institutions. We're about probably 10 or fewer percent of, a, of an LHC experiment. Still uh, quite a lot of people and, and resources and uh, um, an effort to kind of coordinate. The experiment itself is being conducted at a uh, nuclear power plant about uh, 50 or 60 kilometers northeast of uh, Hong Kong. It's a uh, um, there for a variety of reasons, but uh, one is that it, it's a uh, it's one of the most powerful uh, sources of, of neutrinos on the on the planet. Another is that uh, we couldn't get U.S. nuclear power plants to cooperate with us. <laughs> Chinese nuclear power plants seem a little more willing to do so. Um, this is sort of the pic the the, the, the uh, picture of the of the nuclear power plant where you see the there are three pairs of reactors at uh, um, at two locations and the, the um, power plant, our detector is underneath the mountains here in the tunnels that we blasted. So why measure theta-1-3? Um, I guess it was in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, when neutrinos from the um, sun were first measured, it was noticed that uh, um, only about a third or a half of the neutrinos that we expected were actually showing up. After a few false starts, it was uh, postulated that uh, this is due to neutrino oscillations, that is the electron neutrinos from the nuclear reactors and reactions in the sun were turning into other flavors of neutrinos. This is described by this uh, unary, unitary matrix uh, that uh, has uh, three mixing angles, theta 2, 3, theta 1, 3, and theta 1, 2. Now, uh, before, about a year ago, in March, uh, last March, Theta 2, 3 and theta 1, 2 had been measured, but not theta 1, 3. It's the smallest and last uh, unobserved uh, um, mixing angle for, the, for this uh, um, matrix, this uh, lepton mixing matrix. We measured it um, and published our first results in March of last year. It uh, has a lot of physics implications, which I won't try to, to go into. Um, but here's a picture of our detector. As everyone knows, neutrinos are quite difficult to detect. They pass through matter basically unimpeded. They pass through the earth. In fact, uh, quite regularly, I think you're being bathed by neutrinos at the same rate from the sun at night as you are at, at, during the day. The detector itself is fairly large. It's of uh, order 20 tons of uh, um, uh, doped uh, um, liquid scintillator. An uh, electron antineutrino comes in from the reactor. It, uh, um, there's a, not shown here, is a water pool outside of the detector that uh, vetoes cosmogenetic muons or uh, um, radiative back, uh, background radi from radiation. Um, the, muon, the neutrino comes in and interacts, produces a positron and a neutron. The positron, because it's antimatter, uh, annihilates very quickly and produces some gammas that can be seen in the, the phototubes of the detector. And the neutron bounces around, thermalizes, gets absorbed, and actually produces some more light that uh, is produced by the, by the uh, or uh, detected by the photon. So, the, the signal that we're looking for is a very prompt signal and from the positron and a delayed signal from the neutron. Very simple detector. So it just so it turns out that uh, um, uh, the rate at which these, uh, um, at the, the characteristic length for these uh, neutrinos uh, oscillations has a maximum at about two kilometers for the theta-1-3 uh, um, contribution to the oscillation. So what you would like to do for your uh, experiment is to have detectors very near the producer of the neutrinos and then another detector about two kilometers away. And that's, in fact, what we do. We uh, um, have this uh, Y-shaped tunnel where some of the detectors are near one set of uh, nuclear reactors and uh, another set of detectors is close to the other set of nuclear uh, um, reactors from the core. 
and uh, then we have some, uh, some detectors about two kilometers away. So this is the essence of the experiment. You try to measure the neutri neutrino rate here, the neutrino rate there, and calculate the, the disappearance in the theta-1-3 mixing. So this is a NERSC talk. So uh, let me just say that um, Ian uh, described the sort of tier one, tier two uh, model of the LAC computing. We adopted the same nomenclature. NERSC is our tier one in particular. PDSF is where almost all of the, the processing in the United States for uh, um, diabetes happens. All of our data is stored on uh, HPSS, including the raw data and any process data that is unreproducible, meaning that if we have a, a, a data set that actually is at the um, basis of one of our publications, we store it forever at the HPSS. Um, there are on-site data servers. There's a, we have a mix of national and international institutional um, uh, networking we own. We provisioned an OC3 for um, getting data out of the nuclear power plant, but then we go across Chinese, international, and, uh, and U.S. Uh, um, national net, or networks. And we're producing of order 125 terabytes of data per day, about the same amount of, of uh, derived data, or per year, sorry, and about the same amount of uh, um, derived data um, per year as well that we, we need to store. So this is just a, a simple picture of the topology, the network topology. We ship data out of our um, nuclear, our, our experiment to Beijing, um, put it at the, new, at the computing facility there, send it across the Chinese nuclear uh, uh, national network to Hong Kong, across the ocean to the US, and then across the US net to NERSC. Um, we also have some alternatives where uh, um, if uh, something happens, we send it across an alternate uh, Trans-Pacific <coughs> network, or we even have the ability to do manual uh, sneaker net, basically, between the experiment and Hong Kong. And things do happen. We've had network outages because of earthquakes and because of super typhoons. We've even had it at, twice by a uh, um, ship dragging an anchor across a Trans-Pacific uh, um, cable that needs to be <laughs> then uh, repaired. So we're in constant contact with the ESnet folks and the, and the C CSTnet uh, folks to try and um, recover from these, these, kind of, uh, these kind of problems. Because it is a 24-7 24 24 experiment. So the other part of the experiment in computing terms is the software. We sort of operate in a, in a reusable software ecosystem, a lot of data-driven workflow. Um, uh, we've got a lot of component, components, but I'll maybe only um, focus in on three of them. NUAL, which is our uh, um, Gaudi-based uh, um, analysis and simulation framework. Uh, SPADE, which is our, our um, data workflow engine and uh, um, warehouse, and uh, um, OM, ODM, which is our real-time feedback to the scientists. So, science, so Ian showed you this picture, and uh, that's because we're basing our framework on the same architecture that uh, Atlas and LAC base theirs on. I won't go into any detail there, except to say that, that all the scientists write their code in this, in this area here in the algorithms, but there's a lot of code out in the, in the core, and, and uh, as, uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, LBL is responsible for a lot of that on both, uh, both experiments. So there are a couple of reasons to have these component these component architectures. One is just the sheer complexity of the code that you're trying to, to coordinate. Dibay is no atlas, but we've still got ten, hundreds of thousands of lines of code in our, in our system that have to be coordinated. And we have many, many um, components that uh, um, have to operate together. And, and we have adopted a very typical approach, which is that we have sort of common shared uh, foundational analysis components that everybody uses and everybody contributes to, and then sort of individual components that are, are uh, um, specific to particular analyses. And this, you know, this really helped us in doing the um, analysis and trying to get ready for our publications, our first publications, because people could share information, they could, you know, compare results in between the um, different analyses. It, it really helped a lot. But that's, that's new all, but that we have a lot of other pieces. We have uh, SPADE and uh, um, ODM. 
also P squared, which runs on the NERSC machines to drive our, our analysis. I'll just briefly describe those. But these are, this is a really workflow, it's a data-driven workflow um, system so that as data files come in, they get processed through the system, analyzed, and, and presented as results back to the scientist. So SPADE is our data transfer and management system. It was originally designed and uh, um, written at uh, IceCube. We basically redesigned it and re-implemented it um, from the ground up. But we, we adopted it initially un, unaltered, but we've made a lot of improvements, and uh, it's really a very nice piece of code right now. Um, data is produced on site and, uh, um, and gets to the, the uh, PDSF NERSC um, warehouse in about 20 minutes from when it was produced on at, uh, at the nuclear power plant. Um, this is happening 24-7. I and Simon and several people have to keep an eye on it, and there's a lot of monitoring involved in the, in the, the spade system. The, one of the nicest pieces of monitoring that we actually, tools that we have is the offline data monitor. It's uh, um, operating on the NERSC data science data gateways. Um, data is transferred, as I say, from Dia Bay across networks to GPFS at NERSC and HPSS, about 30 minutes. It's automatically uh, run, NUA is automatically run on the data as it comes in. The data is aggregated, combined with the uh, scraped database information and, uh, and even electronic logbook information, and immediately available to users as a, as a set of plots and interactivity that uh, you can do a number of things, including downloading the files. So I basically hit the, uh, um, I was trying to go fast because I think I don't, I don't want us to be too late but, uh, um, for lunch. but. Uh, uh, I've basically hit the, the um, punchline here. We've set up this uh, system. We've been uh, operating it now for several years. Uh, um, about a year ago, December, we actually started taking real data, and all of our preparations really paid off. Um, we were able to get our first Theta-1-3 results within only 75 days of the, uh, of the start of data taking. So it's almost unprecedented. Well. It's, it is unprecedented, in fact, in uh, most people I, I meet in the sort of are, are astonished that we were able to do this. But we were able to see anti-neutrinos in the first field detectors within 24 hours. We were able to see that the far hall neutrino detectors had an uh, anti-neutrino deficit within a week. And uh, as I say, 20 days after we closed our last file, we were able to get a, a high quality Theta-1-3 um, announcement and publication out for the for the March announcement that many of you may have heard. So this was one of the Science Magazine's top 10 breakthroughs of 2010, and I just wanted to, to sort of highlight that uh, um, of the 10 high, of, uh, top 10 breakthroughs of the, um, of the last year, the Higgs boson and the neutrino mixing angle are two of them. And the reason is, of course, that, as Ian said, the standard model of physics doesn't actually have predictive power for many, maybe uh, 18 or 20 something, I guess it depends on how you count uh, um, parameters. And before a year ago, five of those parameters were still unknown. Now two of them have been measured by experiments that uh, we have been involved in here at uh, NERSC and LBL. Any questions? Thank you. David. So if, if theta one three had been smaller uh, by ten percent, would you still be at it? Or it we are still at it. It seems like you got lucky, right? Yes. Well, so yes, this is actually true. So, the the from the physics point of view, we got quite lucky because theta one three was actually much larger than than people had feared it might be. Um, in a sense. A lot of our hard work paid off, and that showed up because it was large. Because it was, if it had been very small, if they did one three, had been very very small. Um, Dye Bay would have been the only experiment that would have been able to measure it. But there are competitors out there. There's Reno and uh, um, T2K and some other experiments in, in Korea and Japan and, and France. A double show that uh, are trying. We're trying to measure the same thing. 
The fact that it was large meant that those experiments could have measured it as well. And uh, um, the fact that we were able to have everything set up and the analysis and data transfer and nurse resources lined up and, and working on day one meant that we were able to get that result out ahead of our competitors, even though the Theta-1-3 was large. So in a sense, we almost were hoping that it was going to be small because then we didn't have any real competition from other experiments. But the fact that it was big means that uh, we could get the result out faster.